The camel has a single hump, the dromedary too. Or else the other way around, uh, I'm never sure, are you? Ogden Nash. Welcome to this week's episode of Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I am your host. I'd like to thank everyone for joining this week. I really appreciate it, uh, and I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Uh, and if you're a newcomer, welcome. I uh, hope you will like it as well as my returning uh, listeners, and I uh, hope you'll go back and um, listen to some prior episodes. <clears throat> And I do want to thank uh, some people. Um, I had mentioned at the end of the show last week, uh, I was hoping to get some more new YouTube subscribers. Uh, i am got three more in the span of uh, between last week and this week. Uh, and I don't know if it's from people finding the show or finding the live streams, uh, but I really appreciate it. And, of course, uh, the viewers or the listeners, uh, the numbers have continued to climb and uh, I'm really appreciative of everyone, so thank you all again. <clears throat> and, and my goal this week is to finish talking about animal domestication uh, for this season. There's uh, a few to go over, um, but I did have a question uh, about horses in comparison to donkeys uh, from last week's episode. And uh, we won't be going over the horse domestication this season. Uh, there's a good amount to talk about with it, but the earliest date I've seen that the process would start is 4000 BC, so right at the end of this season. And uh, that said, most of the evidence of human-horse interaction from this season appears to just be us hunting them. Um, it's possible that domestication began right away, or began right at the very end of this season, but most of the process will take place next season, so... Um, that's why we're not going to be doing a horse this season. Um, in relation to the listener's question, though, I will say that um, wild horses have a different type of social structure than wild asses, and they also live in a very different environment. And uh, male horses' behaviors are different, and they're much more aggressive than male asses. And all these factors make horses a much different type of animal to tame. Uh, but again, we're going to go into detail on all that next season. For now, though, we're going to talk about the domestication of a number of members of the uh, uh, Camelidae family, or you know, camels in general. Uh, now, camel probably came into the English language via an old French dialect, uh, a word something close to chamel, uh, which came from the Latin uh, camelus. Uh, which that came from the Greek, uh, camelos. Uh, that probably, of course, came from either Phoenician or even Hebrew, uh, their uh, gamel, G-A-M-A-L. And the term in those languages are probably somehow related to Arabic jamala, which means to bear. Uh, now, like equids, this family um, was native to North America, and they would migrate to the old world at some point in the very distant past when a land bridge was available. Um, of course, as we will discuss shortly, camelids did not die out in the Americas like equids did. Um, they continued to live, at least in South America. But for now, though, we're going to focus on the first camelids to fall under human control. Uh, and that is the two-humped variety. Uh, also known as the Bactrian camel. Um, now, the term Bactrian is a historical term referring to a region that was uh, in Central Asia. And we'll talk more about that name later when we start to refer to the historical... Uh, when we start talking about that region uh, and its name historically. And I'll go over kind of the origin of that uh, later. Uh, but... Um, some people also refer to these as Mongolian camels, uh, and of course there's just those that call them two-humped camels. Now, their domestication started around 4500 uh, BC, and it happened fairly quickly with the animals reaching neighboring regions to the south, east, and west over the next uh, thousand years or so. 
now, like donkeys, these animals were probably initially used as a food source, um, but you know, quickly provided our uh, even more useful service as uh, long-range uh, pack animals. Uh, they, of course, outperform donkeys due uh, to their greater size, strength, endurance, especially when burdened with, co- uh, with cargo. Uh, Bactrian camels can, er- can carry almost uh, 400 pounds, which is like, um, uh, it's like 180 kilograms. And now, in, even when the horse is introduced, the camel will remain competitive in their shared regions because the camel is much more useful in mountains or hilly terrain uh, and can survive not just, you know, incredible heat, which is, I think, most people, you know, are familiar with the camel, uh, but they can also survive very, very freezing cold temperatures. Uh, and, of course, uh, they can also deal well with, like, rapid switch between those temperatures. Uh, you know, if they're out in the desert in the sun and then the sun goes down and it gets very cold, they are not nearly as bothered by that drastic change as um, other animals. Um, of course, donkeys still remain in use for shorter trips or by people that you know couldn't support a large number of camels um, due to you know availability of fodder and feed and all that kind of stuff. But this is all in the future. At the very start, the people domesticating the Bactrian camel do not have access to the donkey or horse. Uh, now, another benefit of the camel is that their shaggy fur also provides either a lining for other clothes or it can be spun or wrapped uh, to make yarn. And like sheep, this can be collected without harming the animal. Um, now, of course, uh, camels are also known for their ability to conserve water which also makes them useful in the desert, in addition, of course, to their temperature uh, uh, durability, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, But their mouths are also much tougher than other animals. Uh, Like the insides, they don't have as much um, soft tissue, or at least it's it's harder than most other animals. So this lets them eat... um, sharp prickly roots um you know plants that have maybe dried out what have you uh and they're able to you know extract water from those um so that's another reason why they're you know very good um desert or pack animals because they can get a lot of water uh from other sources aside just from drinking it Uh, They're also one of the few species uh, that don't live exclusively in mountains that are smart enough to eat snow to obtain water. Uh, A lot of other species will not uh, do that, Uh, partly because some, in some cases, like eating crushed snow uh, can like cut their mouths up and give infections. Now, uh, there are two varieties of uh, Bactrian camels. Um, There's the Camellus. Uh, Bactrianus, which is the ones we've been talking about, and the Camellus ferris. Um, the ferris is also known as the wild Bactrian camel. And for a long time, it was believed that the ferris was domesticated, or were descendants of uh, domesticated uh, Bactrian camels who were uh, let loose or escaped or got lost from humans. Um, however, apparently, that isn't the case. Uh, the two species are actually separate species, um, with the domesticated breed being primarily descended from a now extinct or full domesticated or a fully domesticated variety of uh, Bac- uh, Bactrian camel. Uh, now, there, of course, has been some level of interbreeding between the two, but their ancestors separated from each other over a million years ago. Um, Now, the ferris is critically endangered, uh, with only, I think, around a thousand or so spread between um, places in Mongolia, like uh, Mongolia and western China. Typically, they can be found on preserves. Uh, And if you were to see a picture of the ferris, um, you would believe definitely that they were uh, that they were wild. Um, Because while they have two humps, their fur is so much shorter and their hair is much more wiry. 
Uh, if you were to see them side by side, you would have probably assumed the Ferris had been um, abused or mistreated. And I, I guess it sort of has, in a way. Um, uh, and there are other ways to tell them apart. Um, the, the wild Ferris um, heads, they, they're flatter. They have uh, kind of flat skulls. And uh, I think the Mongolian term for the for the wild Bactrian camel is uh, it's like half. Uh, I'm going to butcher this. I apologize for any Mongolian listener. Uh, Kavt guy, uh, which meant literally flat. Um, and there, there were for camel. Uh, I guess the domesticated variety is uh, Teme. And um, while I was kind of researching this, I found out that in chess are. You know, in Mongolia, in when they're referring to the chess pieces, they call the bishop uh, camels. Um, another difference between uh, the domesticated and wild uh, varieties of Bactrian camels is that their feet are shaped differently. Um, so, and there there are other small external differences you can use to tell them apart. Um, now, behaviorally uh, speaking, uh, the Bactrian camel was very well suited to the type of lifestyle of the people domesticating it. Uh, they lived in small herds uh, of no more than 30, but they could be as small as five individuals, and they were very much constantly on the move. Uh, humans were probably tracking the same herd from, generati- uh, from generation to generation uh, before they fully began to corral and control them. Uh, male camels are generally only super aggressive during mating season, and even then they lash mainly out at other male camels. Um, and I could see humans waiting for mating season and killing a herd's head, and then using the um, kind of the you know stunned females to attract a nearby bachelor herd of young males, uh, and then they would you know then probably allow a couple of the males to breed, and they would corral. Um, or keep pack animals of the others, or butcher them uh, as needed. Uh, of course, this would still increase the number of breeding males, and honestly, most young bachelor camels would you know, never be able to breed in the wild just due to the way numbers uh, and competition between them worked. Um, but they would be drawn still um, by controlled herds in hopes of mating, uh, and you know, probably kept nearby, um, and the humans would keep them safe from other breeding males, or at least keep them uh, separated most of the time. I'm sure there were periods where humans would probably allow them to fight it out to see which one was fitter, to see which one would be uh, the better sire of their inevitable herds. So again, even the even the wild males or the young bachelor herds would still um, their chances of breeding breeding and survival would still increase. Um, of course, provided enough food was available, a, no, a number of young males were probably kept on hand for uh, a number of reasons. Maybe they need a new herd uh, to be started for a son about to become a man, um, or you know they need a dowry that needs to be paid, um, or maybe, maybe they just needed more labor. Um, and if they were nearby long enough, their chances of breeding was, again, much better in captivity. So they could... Essentially, as long as they had control of females, who, again, typically, uh, compared to males, are much more docile, um, they wouldn't necessarily have to control uh, that many males. They could just use their presence of the females to kind of bring them in as needed. So, uh, and then, of course, as time went by and, you know, more young males were born in these herds, you know, they could raise them from birth to be... Uh, a little bit more controllable than, you know, the wild, uh, uh, or still wild uh, cousins or what have you. Uh, now, young female camels, they were also driven from their family herds uh, in search of males once they reached sexual maturity. Um, and, you yeah, know, they would typically only gravitate towards males who were already in, you know, who already had a herd of their own. Um, and this was done so, you know, that there wouldn't be any, um, or too close, uh, too much inbreeding uh, between the animals. This was done uh, naturally on the camel's part. Um, but once, of course, domestication began, 
<clears throat> excuse me, um, it's very possible that young females, once they reach the age of maturity, um, they would possibly be moved to another corral, uh, traded to a nearby uh, a neighboring family that had their own herds of cattle. Uh, perhaps they were traded along with uh, family members for marriages. You know, we'll give you our daughter and these camels to increase your herd and your family respectively. Uh, you know, and this would establish long-term uh, you know, mutually beneficial relationships. Uh, it would probably be conducive to keeping peace uh, between various human groups. Um, you know, and just again, establishing long-term um, good relationships between neighboring families and clans and tribes or whatever you want to call it. Now, in terms of um, reproduction and increasing numbers, um, camels can take a while to give birth. Um, I think it's up to 13 months. Um, so a female camel essentially gives birth every other year. Uh, and it varies, but typically a camel becomes sexually mature sometime between three to five years of age. Um, so while it would take a while, uh, their numbers would increase much more uh, drastically than wild populations because, again, people are making sure that, um, that they are protected from predators and things like that. Uh, and to humans... Um, of course, they're, they are still butchering these animals to eat on occasion, but typically they wouldn't do that unless, um, unless there was a specific reason. They would probably uh, wait until they had you know uh, re replacement numbers available before slaughtering too many. Unless you know there was a period of just famine, there wouldn't be enough feed to go around or enough uh, grazing lands. In which case, they might get rid of a number of animals before uh, it became a very big problem um, but uh, those are all possibilities on you know why humans would uh, butcher their own uh, herds but the slower rate does uh, prevent this species from being as widespread as uh, the horse or the donkey and i believe the dromedary uh, the single hump camels also produce reproduce slightly quicker but I, i'm not as sure on that um, but uh, we will not be discussing the dromedary camel this season because like the horse, uh, it will not be domesticated until next season. Uh, and it is going to be domesticated in a different region by a different groups of people. Uh, however, there are other camelid species that we will be talking about now. Um, in fact, there are four species we need to discuss that are living in uh, the New World, um, that being, um, and that they're being domesticated around 4, 000, uh, 5,000 to 4,000 BC. Uh, these are the alpaca, the llama, the vicuna, and the guanaco. Uh, now, uh, the vicuna is the primary ancestor of the alpaca. Uh, the guanaco is the role, uh, is in that role for the llama, excuse me. Uh, Though both the llama and alpaca, or at least portions of their populations, have been crossbred with each other and with their wild cousins. So uh, the vicuna and guanaco uh, have very similar social structures uh, to wild camels. One male, several females, and they're young. And um, another factor for the, um, at least for the American camelids or the South American camelids, they are all extremely uh, have extremely great hearing. Uh, that's one of their stronger um, senses. Uh, now, the English term for vicuna is uh, is essentially an adoption of the Spanish word uh, vicuña, although um, of course we don't put the accent on the n. Uh, and the Spanish got the word from the Quechua um, word vicuna. And Quechua is an Incan language, and uh, that was the native name for the animal. Uh, and they lived in and around the Andes Highlands. Um, and in the 1970s, they were endangered, but um, now they have actually made a very big comeback and have been removed from uh, the endangered species list. Uh, and this was after the governments um, where the animals historically lived kind of 
they banded together and set up a kind of prevention, uh, a convention, excuse me, to protect them. Uh, and that included uh, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. Now, these creatures are thinner, shorter um, than uh, their, um, the other camelids, uh, but they are also very fast and agile than the other uh, South American camelids. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, their fur is, ex is short, but it's extremely soft. And it's excellent for staying warm. In fact, one of the major reasons that the animal has made such a big comeback is because of its fur. Uh, essentially, people have begun to trap the animals, shear them, and then release them into the wild. Of course, the way their fur grows, um, it only gets long enough to shear after around three years, which is part of the reason why uh, the alpaca has been bred the way it has. Uh, they're, they're able to be sheared much more regularly, and their fur is much thicker. Uh, of course, this does have a trade in that it isn't as naturally soft, um, but, I mean, it's still, it's still very soft in terms of, um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, but it is not as soft as vacuna fur. Um, but like sheep, uh, they have a much wider variety of fur colors, uh, which allow it to be dyed uh, uh, easier, I guess. Of course, they also served as meat. Um, and uh, another thing that alpaca are used for is that they can be trained. Um, they're extremely wary of canids like foxes, and they will aggressively attack them. They will charge. They will try to stomp and kill them. Uh, and in fact, um, now, uh, these days, uh, alpaca are kind of integrated with sheep herds, and they will use alpaca to protect not only them, themselves, but also sheep herds. So they kind of serve as a substitute for dogs in some places. Now, um, alpaca comes into English from uh, the Spanish alpaca. Uh, and the Spanish probably got the word from uh, the Aymara language, where it was alpaca, uh, which uh, is believed to be related to the Quechua uh, word paake or um, pa'ak, maybe. I'm not sure, again, of the, the native pronunciation. Um, and which of the two, uh, Quechua or Aymara, is the older version and who got it from who, I couldn't get a firm answer on that either. Uh, now, uh, the uh, other wild camelid, uh, the guanaco, lives uh, at lower levels of elevation than the vicuna, but they do share a little bit of the highlands, or at least the altitudes where they overlap. Um, they're, they're slightly lower. Um, though they will uh, venture into the plains and flatlands if they're not far from the foothills that is their primary home, um, which is something the vicuna do not do. Now, uh, the guanaco are larger than the vicuna and much stronger, though, they're, again, they're not as fast. Um, the vicuna, they stand around, uh, I think, 2.5 to 2.8 feet at the shoulders. Um, and the guanaco stand between, I think, 3.3 .3 and 3.9 feet. And alpaca are between 2.7 and 3.2 feet. And um, llamas are like 5 0.6 to 5.9. Now, uh, guanaco fur is soft and warm, though not quite as fine as the vicuna. Um, they also have like a rough skin, like I guess not a sack, but like a, a rough like um, I I, I, I want to say it's almost like a um, I, I'm trying to think of this like almost like a tongue or a, a thong of like leather uh, that's up and down their throat. Uh, and this leathery mass was actually, um, you know, uh, used by humans to make shoes or foot wraps. Uh, and llamas have these too. And that's one of the reasons that llamas are domesticated. Um, now this actual uh, like thick leather um, guard over their throat uh, would prevent predators from killing them or maiming them with a single bite. Uh, so that's uh, that's one of the reasons that they were 
uh, or gets raised, or in the Guanago's case, uh, killed. And this is not a trait that the Vicuna or the alpacas share. Um, but, of course, they were, llamas uh, were used for, of course, food, wool, labor, just like the alpaca were. That they share. That's, um, that's a trait that all of these animals uh, kind, of, kind of have in common. Um, now, Guanaco shared a very similar geographic range as the Kuna, except they probably had more numbers in the far south of the continent, um, the Patagonia region, Argentina. I think there were more of them there. And they had a very similar problem to the Vicuna in terms of population. Uh, and their numbers have rebounded in some countries, I think mainly Chile and Argentina, but in others they're still endangered. Um, but in general, they're, they're not, it's, they're more of a complicated situation. I think if you were just look at their population numbers, they're not considered endangered. But in some of the countries that they lived in or currently live in, they are considered endangered. Um, and that's not because they're liked any less than the Bakuna. Um, their environments that they were used to in those places are more in use by humans. Um, again, they don't live quite as high up as Vicuna do, so they're more likely to live in areas that uh, humans are using more regularly. Um, but like Vicuna, their fur is used to make extremely soft, expensive designer wool. Um, <clears throat> so that is that is another feature of the Guanaco. Um, the llama is much more like, uh, of course, the guanaco, except it is larger, and it has more variety in its fur cover, or color, excuse me. Uh, and behaviorally, they are extremely similar to the alpaca. Uh, and this makes sense when you understand that alpaca and llamas have been interbred together at various times, you know, at various regions, um, pretty much for all of human history after the domestication or during their domestication and after, I guess is probably the better way to phrase that. Uh, now, the name for the guanaco uh, gets its name from the Quechua word, wanaku, um, and we get the term uh, from the Spanish who, who kind of adopted um, uh, uh, guanaco um, from Quechua. Uh, now, llama uh, is, of course... Uh, from Spanish, uh, and they got it from the Quechua language, which again, it's the same. It's llama, so it's a direct uh, carryover from. Our llama is a direct carryover, and then Guanaco is a corruption of Wanaku. And I think that will finish us up with the camelids for this season. So um, it's time for us to move back into. Uh, Asia, uh, where we're going to be talking about um, the chicken, or at least the ancestor of the chicken, and that is the red jungle fowl. Apologies for the cut there. Uh, the fire trucks were screaming down the road, so I had to wait for them to get through. So, um, yes, we're going to be talking about the red jungle fowl. Uh, now, of course, red, the color, has evolved from the Old English Read, uh, which itself is ultimately believed to have come from a uh, proto-Indo-European root word that have been that would have been close to something like uh, rude and uh, jungle, which entered English from uh, Hindi, uh, the Hindi word jungal, uh, which meant um, essentially a desert or a forest or a wasteland that was uncultivated or you know un uncontrolled by humans. Uh, and this is probably a descendant from uh, Sanskrit, uh, jangalas, uh, which meant uh, arid or sparsely growing uh, with like trees. Um, and where they got the word isn't known. Um, if it was their invention or if it came from another earlier language, we're, we're not sure. Uh, fowl comes into English, um, well, it was the old English word fugal. Uh, and this was just a generic general term for all birds. Uh, and itself was probably uh, descended from the Proto-Germanic uh, fuglas, which is traced 
from like a Proto-Indo-European word uh, that was like pluik or plu, which meant to uh, to flow. Uh, and uh, of course, the German, the modern German, uh, I think, is uh, flugel is uh, is foul. Uh, interestingly enough, um, the term bird in English, we're not sure where it came from. We're not sure, you know, where uh, where we pick that that up. It is not something that's similar in other uh, Germanic languages, at least um, that I was able to find. Um, but initially in English, it was just used to mean like a young bird or a young uh, fowl. But I just thought that was an interesting uh, fact that, that doesn't really have anything to do with the, uh, the red jungle fowl. Um, but uh, this bird's historic range covered all of mainland Southeast Asia, some of the islands in Southeast Asia, uh, what is now southern China and Hainan, um, the western portion of the Indian subcontinent, uh, and a bunch of the valleys where the Indian plates meets uh, meets the Tibetan Plateau, uh, Shiva's tresses, that area. Um, and now, when this is happening is debated. I think most current sources say it's happening between um, 6,000 and 5,000 BC, maybe as late as 4,000. Uh, but there are other theories that put it earlier, possibly as early as 7,000 BC. Uh, one of the reasons for the difficulty in dating for this comes from the fact that the animal's bones are so small and hollow, of course. Uh, this makes it possible for bones or their fragments to easily shift uh, layers in terms you know, of where they're buried in the ground. Say something like um, they could have been um, you know, pushed lower by people who would originally used them. Um, maybe they threw them in middens or were dropping them in holes that had been used at earlier periods that were now abandoned. Uh, they were just using that as like a trash dump. Uh, it's also possible that they were dug up and not noticed until later. And then there are higher levels of the soil. Um, that's not even to mention that due to the similarities between early domestic breeds of chicken and the red jungle fowl, it's hard to know if you're looking at wild animals that were hunted or trapped or if you're looking at a butchered domestic bird. Or even if it's another species of small bird altogether. Uh, there are a number of uh, ground-based um, uh, guinea fowl and things like that from other species that you know could have just as easily been that instead of a red jungle fowl. Another point of debate is the location of domestication. Uh, at one point, it was believed to have taken place in several locations at once. Uh, some claim it have taken place in China. Others that it happened in India. Um, there's there's been a number of theories and claims put forward. In some cases, by people who have a nationalistic agenda uh, to kind of make their country's history seem a little bit more important. Um, but I think generally speaking, um, right now at least, um, most people believe it happened somewhere in mainland Southeast Asia. We're not sure exactly where, but from genetic testing of remains, it looks like there was a kind of a centralized region somewhere between um, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, somewhere in that region is where the first domestic birds were um, tamed, and then they spread out from there. Now, that is not to say that, that other domestication events did not happen later, but if that did happen later, uh, they intermixed with these original domesticated birds at some point, and there's just been no uh, evidence, genetically speaking, we haven't found these other um, un- I guess, uninterbred birds, if they existed. Um, but there are other wild jungle fowl that exist outside of Southeast Asia that have contributed to the modern chicken's DNA, uh, or at least certain breeds of modern chickens. Um, there are some chickens that have uh, multiple jungle fowl lineages. 
there's some that have just red jungle fallowing ages, and there's some that have one or two, as opposed to like three or four. Um, and there's no evidence that uh, these other jungle fowls ever had like a domesticated variety. Um, there's none where it's like, oh, their DNA is primarily descended from these other jungle fowl varieties. Um, and these jungle fowl are the, um, there's the gray jungle fowl, the Sri Lankan jungle fowl, and the green jungle fowl. Um, the gray jungle fowl is the one that you see um, kind of in uh, central uh, and eastern India. Uh, they, in fact, they have a little bit of overlap with the red jungle fowl in the wild. Um, and then you have um, the Sri Lankan jungle fowl, which, of course, is on the island of Sri Lanka. Uh, and then you have the, uh, the green jungle fowl. And those are um, native to uh, the islands of Southeast Asia. Uh, Java, uh, Bali, I think, is one. Komodo. Uh, the Flores Islands, um, and there's a bunch of smaller ones, of course, that uh, they're native to as well. So, um, yeah, again, various different breeds um, contributed to some species, but all chicken species are in some way primarily descended from uh, the red jungle fowl. Um, now, um, those birds are very skittish. They're shy. Uh, their first reaction is to run from danger unless they can't um, or they have to defend their nest or young. Um, their roosters can be much more aggressive and will willing attack, excuse me, much, will uh, willingly attack uh, much larger uh, animals uh, to defend their, their flocks. Um, now, uh, how we were able to domesticate these birds is somewhat of a mystery. Um, again, because they are so skittish, it's hard to say how humans are able to gain control of them because, again, they tend to run from people. Uh, what I think is the most likely way is that we were building structures to attract the birds in uh, somewhere to allow them to build nests that were easy to defend uh, and then we just kind of uh, took uh, from them as needed. Um, also uh, human fields would have been very attractive uh, places for the birds to gather and to eat. They're omnivores like chickens. Uh, they would have loved to kind of pick at the, um, the dug up roots and grasses uh, growing in harvested fields, eat uh, bugs, their larvae. Um, so it would have been a very mutually beneficial uh, arrangement. Um, of course, as time went on, uh, the birds would have grown more accustomed to humans being around. Um, uh, but this was probably a very long and painful process, uh, at least for you know the humans, um, you know, trying to get full control of them. Now, uh, another thing that humans liked about um, or, and I guess uh, not liked. Excuse me. Um, another thing that the um, that the humans would have uh, prized about the chickens is uh, at least among the male roosters, um, they would have uh, uh, crowed every morning with the rising of the sun. That's something, of course, that uh, modern farmers are familiar with. Um, they have an extra sensitivity to light so they're able to see the sun rising earlier than humans uh, so it would have been a good warning hey the sun's coming up it's time to get uh, going and uh, moving um, also their uh, the male feathers at least are very bright and colorful they can be reddish but they can also be um, uh, oranges as well uh, female feathers tend to be gray on um, brown uh, but they're speckled so you know they do have a nice pattern um so these would have you know using the feathers for decoration would have been useful as well um the bird has a very big religious importance uh for a number of cultures um cockfighting uh was seen as kind of a religious ceremony in certain ways 
uh, and it's today it's still popular in parts of the world, um, even though there are those parts of the world that certainly frown on it for being cruel. But it's important to remember that the cockfighting that we're dealing with at these earlier periods, um, they don't have these extra long metal spurs. It's, it's literally just the birds, the roosters competing against one another. Um, you know, mano a mano, I guess, or rooster or roost versus rooster. Um, you know, a much more, I guess, um, primal, uh, natural thing. And, of course, these birds do compete naturally uh, for control of flocks. Um, now, I'm going to go over a couple little other stuff. I've had a couple of crashes in the last 15 minutes, so I may, I don't think I'm going to repeat some stuff, but if I have, I do apologize. Um, I wanted to also cover the domestication of pigs, but uh, after I finish this segment, I'm going to go ahead and call it uh, and try to fix what's going on with the dasty here. Um, but uh, eggs, uh, these roosts, or the chickens don't lay eggs every day the way they do today. Um, this is something that humans bred them to do over time. Um, we don't really have evidence of like a, a hatchery, uh, a location uh, set up for uh, hens laying eggs daily. Um, I think the earliest example we have from that is um, the Middle East and Egypt, and that's sometime between 1500 and 1400 BC. Um, and the birds don't get to the Middle East until about 2000. That includes um, Egypt as well. And they get to Europe a little bit later. Um, they do go on the water routes along with the Polynesian migrations and Austronesian migrations. Um, but um, yeah, they kind of spread out in separate ways. The ones coming from the Middle East probably came from India. Uh, the ones from uh China actually probably came from Taiwan and maybe not uh, Southeast Asia directly. At least that's what kind of the current evidence is showing. Uh, now, in terms of etymology for chicken, uh, this is a Middle English word. It came from a, the Old English uh, season, uh, and the plural of that would have been like uh, sisinu. Um, and this is from uh, an older Proto-Germanic root, uh, quick, uh, which is probably where we get the term cock. Um, a lot of the Proto-Indo-Europeans for, um, for chicken would have been related to uh, hen, uh, which was, uh, of course, a, a female chicken. Um, an adult female chicken that was laying eggs is a hen. This probably came from the Proto-Indo-European con, which meant to sing. Um, and there is a male version of hen. It's something close to um, a hanen, uh, would have been the, I guess, the male version of hen. Um, and a chicken in at least when the English were first using it, it meant like a younger uh, female chicken, like a, one that's not really laying eggs yet, probably. Uh, it could have just meant just baby as well. Uh, now, rooster uh, is, um, it came uh, into use, I think, in the, um, I think it was like the early 1600s, and it immediately meant the roosting bird, the bird that is, you know, sitting down, kind of looking around, uh, looking after everything. Um, this was, um, I found a note on etymology.com where it said that it, it became favored in the U.S. Um, in the, like, early 1800s, and it was listed as a Yankeeism because a lot of um, Puritans or people descended from Puritans um, found it, an acceptable alternative to cock because at that point in the English language that had become a, um, a slang term for, for penis. So um, rooster is kind of an American Puritan word uh, for the bird. So uh, I felt that was funny. Um, yeah, so um, I hope I didn't miss anything. I hope I was able to recover everything. If I've made any mistakes, I am going to kind of listen through 
um, but I really want to get this published. I know I've had some background noise. There were some uh, kids outside for some reason at 8.39 at night on the Sunday. Um, they were just playing soccer, which is cool. I just, I'm just surprised they're doing it this late on the weekend. But um, I'm going to try to cut some of the noise out. But again, I really want to make sure that this gets saved and published. Um, thank you all for joining me. I apologize if it's a little rough. Um, but I will see you all next week. We'll finish up domestication. Uh, we'll be talking about pigs. Um, but yeah, um, thank you all. Um, please like, subscribe, favorite, rate five stars on whatever service you're using and listening to me on. Uh, I really, really appreciate you. And I hope you have a good rest of your day and a good rest of your week. Thank you again. Oh, um, any questions or feedback, email me at war at revpod at gmail.com. You can send me a direct message on Twitter slash X, or you can comment on any of my YouTube videos, or if you see me streaming, drop in, say hi, uh, ask a question there. I'll be glad to try to answer it. Uh, but yeah, I'll see everyone next time. Peace.